we believe that the scriptures aren't ancient, um, but that they have power for today, that the Holy Spirit is still working and he is still redeeming people and he is still turning that which is dead into life. And it doesn't matter where you are on your journey, whether you've been following Jesus for all your life or whether you've been following him for just a little while, or maybe you just came because somebody invited you today. I'm telling you, um, there is room at the table for you. There's room at the table for you. And if you are new and if church is a new place for you, whether you're in this room or watching online, um, here's my promise to you that you will hear the story of Jesus with clarity. Um, and that by the end of this, you might be overwhelmed. Now I'm gonna try my best not to cry, but I make no promises. Um, you might be overwhelmed. You might, you might feel something toward him. Uh, and I'm speaking to those of you who, man, you, you've been following him for a long time or you don't know him at all. You, you, you will see him for who he is. And so that's my promise to you. You say, how can you promise such a thing? <laughs> because the Holy Spirit is here. And um, I'm under the conviction that as a preacher, um, I'm not the only one speaking. as we were worshiping and we were singing that song be praised let there never be a day let there never be a day that I don't rise to sing you praise you know we're never going to run out of reasons to praise God And if, if you're tired of praising God, I would just argue that you haven't looked at him long enough. You haven't looked at him long enough. Because I promise you, the more you look at him, the more you see him, the more you'll praise him. Now, I want to read to you out of a story in Luke 15, and you might be familiar with this story, but... I'm going to invite us to look at this story a little bit differently because I believe the story really, if we understand it, will reveal the heart of Christianity. It will reveal the heart of the gospel if we understand it for what it is. And of course, in order to do that well, we have to be honest and open and transparent and take God's word for what it is. And I know that we live in a world that constantly is progressing and believes that new is always better. I'm here to tell you that there are some ancient things that we need to bring back. He is called the ancient of days. You know? There are some things we can't turn over and, and rebrand and make new. No, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yeah. And so this Luke 15 is, um, we have this chapter as a response to the relationship Jesus has with sinners. He is pressed, he is challenged, he is pushed back against in regards to his relationship with sinners, in regards to his relationships with people who don't qualify. And, and so he begins to tell three different parables. Uh, this chapter has sometimes been titled the chapter uh, of the lost. Thank you so much. 
the chapter of the lost because Jesus, in response to this criticism and this pushback, tells the parable of the lost sheep. And then he tells the parable of the lost coin. And the parable that we're gonna turn into, turn to, is forever been called the parable of the prodigal or the parable of the lost son. But what sets this parable apart from the first two is that in the first two, the one who lost the thing goes after it. The shepherd goes after the sheep he lost. The woman goes after the coin she lost. But in this parable, no one goes after the lost son. And so there's a distinction between this parable and the first two parables. If the first two parables teach us of the lost sheep and the second parable teaches us of the lost coin, I think this parable teaches us what it means to be lost. What does it mean? What does it mean to be lost? And sometimes I think for some of us who have been so familiar with Christianity, not Jesus, Christianity, because there is a difference. we sometimes have forgotten the state in which God found us. And for some of us, we have graduated the cross. Ladies and gentlemen, you never graduate the cross. You never graduate the cross. For Paul says, hey, listen, the Greeks, they seek after wisdom. The Jews, they seek after miracles, but it's in the preaching of the cross that we find the power of God's salvation. That the wisdom of the world looks at the cross and says, hey, it's foolishness, but those, to, those who are, to, to those who are drawing near to salvation, it is the power of God to save. And so we don't graduate, we don't graduate the cross. And so the lost sheep, the lost coin, and I think this parable defines for us, what does it mean? What does it mean to be lost? You know, we, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. <laughs> it was grace that set me free. And so what is lostness? What is it? What does it mean to be lost? And the title of our time together is, is the lost son. And what we're gonna get into, I know we call it the prodigal son's story, but Jesus never calls it the prodigal son's story. This, in fact, isn't necessarily the story of the prodigal son. It's actually a story of two sons. It's a story of two sons. Jesus actually says there's a man who had two sons, and that's what Jesus starts this story off with. And I think the point of that is, if you're not familiar with the story, we'll get into it. If you are familiar with the story, then listen to this. I think the point of the two sons rather than just the one prodigal son is this, that, that you can be outside of your home and be lost, and yet you can be inside your home and still be lost. And so there's a son we know that leaves his father's house, and he's lost. And yet we're told of another son who remains at his father's house, but I would argue he is also lost. <laughs> The older son's lostness, I think, is actually more dangerous than the younger son's. Why? Because the younger son's lostness is, it's, it's obvious, whereas the older son's lostness is not so obvious. In fact, if you told the younger son, hey, you're lost, you're far from God, you're far from the Father, he would say, I know, but I chose this. I chose this. I chose to leave my father's house. I chose to be on my own. I chose to do my own thing. And so I don't really care if you say I'm far from God. I chose this life. But if you turn to the older son and say, hey, I don't think you really know the father, well, he would be indignant. He would respond with anger and rage. He would be mad. What are you talking about? I don't know the father. And he would begin to list out his works that to him says otherwise. And yet both are lost. So there is a younger son and there is an older son. So let's turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 15. I'm gonna invite you to stand as we read God's word today.
We're going to read Luke 15, 1, and then we're going to jump down to verse 11. Luke 15, 1. Remember, Jesus is being pressed about his relationships with sinners and tax collectors. So the Pharisees say to him, um, or Luke 15, 1 says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. Right? So, you know, we got to ask the question, what kind, of, what kind of people does Jesus attract? Okay? Now, before you say the wrong answer, here's the right answer. The kinds of people that Jesus attracts are those who want to be set free. That's it. And in those days and age, the people who wanted to be set free the most were the sinners and the tax collectors. And so Jesus is getting pressed by the Pharisees. Hey, how come you keep hanging around these guys? These guys aren't qualified. And so Jesus begins to tell them three parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and now the lost son. Let's get into it. Jesus continued saying, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me the share of my estate. So the father divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. His resources ran out. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. And if you're Jewish, you would understand how inappropriate that is. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Verse 17, when he came to his senses, <laughs> when he came to his senses, maybe you have a similar story. You were doing your own thing, but all of a sudden you came to your senses and you realized that life without the father is a desperate life, is a lowly life. And so he came to his, his senses and he said, and how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. Verse 18, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion, not condemnation, compassion. And he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and he kissed him. Wait, hold on. He's still covered in pig mud. <laughs> oh, the father doesn't care what filthiness is over you. <laughs> no, no, he's going to embrace you and kiss you and celebrate you. So the son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against you. Again, he's going over the speech he's prepared. I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your father, uh, call your son. But the father said to his servants, he ignores the son's speech. Hey, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. By the way, the best robe in that day and age would have been the father's robe. So he gets clothed in the father's robe, man. <laughs> the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now, if this was the story of just the prodigal son, it would end there, but it doesn't. It's the story of the two sons. Verse 25, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near to the house, he heard the music and the dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, hey, what's going on? The servant says, hey, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has had him back safe and sound. The older brother became very angry and he refused to go in. The one who remained in the house is now outside the house. So his father went in and he pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. I've been slave. wait, hold on, I thought you were a son. All these years I've been slaving 
for you. I never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, notice he doesn't even call him his brother. When this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home and kills the fat, you kill the fattened calf for him. And the verse 31, he says, my son, you're always with me and everything I have is yours, with the, which is such an accurate statement. How is this such an accurate, accurate statement? Because the father already divided his property into half. He gave the younger son what was his. Everything that remained belonged to the older son. He was the only heir. Everything I have is yours. Verse 32, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours, in case you forgot, he's your brother. He was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and he is found. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for the scripture and we thank you for this story. We thank you that it reveals your heart. It reveals your heart. And so Holy Spirit, impress the Father's heart onto our heart for these next few moments. Help us to hear him, to see him, and to know him for who he is, for only you can do that. Come have your way. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. If you haven't said hi to anybody around you, please welcome someone around you before you grab a seat. So this story is a story about how many sons? Two sons. See, you're paying attention. You're so good. <laughs> this is a story about, about two sons. Now, in order to understand this story appropriately, we have to understand the context of the day. We have to understand the audience of, of Jesus. Now, here's what you have to know, okay? Um, the audience of Jesus was made up, really, of two types of crowds, Right? Two types of crowds. A uh, one crowd that probably made the majority of his following, made up the majority of his following, they would have related to the younger son. They would have been, they would have been the younger brother crowd. Those who are far from God, those who don't know God, those who have been rejected by the elites, the Pharisees and the religious system. They've been told, hey, get your life together before you come home. These were the sinners and the tax collectors. These are the people the Pharisees has a problem with. These are, uh, these are the people uh, of why Jesus is even being questioned. Hey, what's going on even with your followers here? You're supposed to be a rabbi and yet these are the kinds of people you attract? That made up the majority of Jesus' following. However, there is a second crowd. And the second crowd is the crowd of the older brother. That is the crowd of the Pharisees. That is the crowd of the religious leaders. That is the crowd that is pressing Jesus, has a problem with Jesus, and they fail to see Jesus for who he is. And so you have to understand the dynamic. Uh, there's a crowd that is following Jesus because they actually want to receive from him. They want to be set free from their bondage and their captivity. They want to be set free from their sin. They want to be set free from their sickness. And yet there's another crowd that's kind of just lurking. Right? Uh, they don't really want anything from Jesus, but, but, but yet they're still gravitated toward him. Only they're gravitated toward him with judgmental eyes, with condemnation, uh, feeling superior. So, so this is the crowd. I want you to paint, I, I, want, I want you to see the picture. This is the crowd that's following Jesus. There is a crowd that is the younger brother crowd and there's the crowd that is the older brother crowd. And so it's no wonder Jesus tells this story of the two sons. Because if you're in the audience of Jesus, you would relate to either one. Either you would relate to the younger son who's gone away, who's far from the father and now is being invited back home or you would relate to the older son. Now here is the interesting thing. If you get to the end of the story, we don't know what the older son, we don't know what his response is. The story kind of just ends incompletely. We know that the younger son Man, he gets restored, they celebrate, they party. But the older son is invited back into the, into the house and then the story just ends. Which tells me what? It tells me that the main audience for this parable were not sinners and tax collectors. The main audience for this parable were the Pharisees. 
And it's almost as if Jesus is saying, hey, you have to respond now. And so he leaves the response out of the story. So let's, let's talk about these two sons. Are you ready? So there's the younger son. Now, the younger son, man, he, he represents um, the kind of person who's just longing for independence. I think uh, he, he kind of represents really our, our society and, and what has become normal in society. He's, he's the type of individual who, who just can't wait to move out. Been there? Man, as soon as I get enough money, as soon as I put things together, man, I am out of my parents' home. I'm gone. See you as soon as I get a job. Bye-bye. Right? And so he's that type of individual. He's the individual who's, who's a dreamer. He's an independent. He's like, man, I'm going to go get my job. I'm going to make a living. I'm going to go move downtown and live the life. Right? He's, he's that. He's that guy. And, and, and I, think, I think it's a good representation of our society, isn't it? Uh, these are the people who, who feel bogged down by the opinions of others, bogged down by uh, traditions, and they, they want to introduce new norms just for the sake that they're new. How many know uh, not everything that's new is better? Yeah. Right? But these are the individuals, man, I'm just, I'm just tired of living by the opinions of other people. I want to do my own thing. I want to be led by my own decisions Forget the opinions of others. Forget the traditions of other people. That's what the younger, um, younger son uh, represents. The younger son believes that true satisfaction comes by living by his own rules. That's when I'm ultimately free. Is when I'm living by my own rules, when I'm living by my own agenda, and I'm doing my thing. I- I'm doing me. Right? We-, we know that seems to be the mantra of the day. Man, I'm, ju- I'm just doing me. Now, this, this younger son, what happens is, of course, he gets tired of, of living at home, living under his father's rule, his father's reign, and he says, hey, dad, um, give me your inheritance. Give me the inheritance that is coming to me. Now, I want you to understand that in this context, in this culture, um, you don't get your inheritance while your father is still alive. That's not how it works. You, you actually have to be patient enough <laughs> right, for your father to pass away. And then you get the inheritance. So in other words, when he is asking for his inheritance at a time when his father is not dead, in other words, he's saying, hey, you might as well be. So I want you to understand the incredible dishonor and disrespect that this younger son has for the father. And I know we kind of paint this picture as this like, man, this romantic story and that when Jesus' Jesus's audience would have heard the story, they would have been filled with like emotions and, and, and fuzzies inside and all of that. I want you to know that actually it was the opposite. The point of the story was to get the audience incredibly angry. This is, in that day and age, if you are the audience of Jesus' day and age, and it's particularly the audience that this parable is painted towards and and spoken towards, you would be mad. Like, the moment he asks for his inheritance before the father's father dies, I want you to understand that Jaws would have hit the floor. And they would have been like, what? Only to to think probably, okay, let's see. We all know what the father's going to do. The father... The father's going to kick the son out and go, hey, listen, get out of here, you disrespectful and dishonoring son. You get to leave with no inheritance. Everything I have is going to go to the older son, so bye-bye. That's not what happens. So not only are they shocked and horrified at the fact that this guy asks for the inheritance, they are shocked and horrified that the father actually gives it to him. Wait, what? Hold on, you didn't kick him out? Throw him to the curb? for the dishonor and the disrespect. So that's what the father should have done. Now, now here's, here's something interesting that, that happens. He says, he says, hey, father, give me, give me the property that is coming to me. That word in the original language is wealth, right? But when the father, when, when Jesus says the father divided his property with the two, he uses a different word. He doesn't use the same word that means wealth. He uses a word called bios, which actually means life. 
catch this. He asks for wealth, the Father gives life. He divides his life between the two. Okay? In other words, basically the Father has rid himself of any, anything for himself, any resources for himself. He goes, okay, everything, my whole life, I'm gonna divide it up between you two. And so within a couple of days, um, the son goes, man, I could be doing more with this money out there than in here. And he goes, I'm gone, bye, see ya. I'm moving downtown, living with the crazies. <laughs> downtown is wild. You know what I mean? Like, I just, I feel like, I feel like it's not safe for anyone, you know? Um, pray, for, pray for the people that live down, if you, does anyone live downtown Toronto? You do. I'm praying for you because that's, man, as soon as it's sunset, go indoors. You know what I mean? It's like one of those scary movies where the crazies come out at night. Um, and it's like, somebody told me, this is a good friend of mine, somebody told me, hey, when that happens, you just got to pretend like you're crazy too. <laughs> I go, what? They go, yeah, they won't bother you if they think you're one of them. Like, I'm like, Huh? <laughs> I've yet to try it because I always leave before it gets too dark, but somebody try that out for me. Let me know how it goes. Um, so he, 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 in, he divides his life. He gives them the property. And um, the younger son, he, he enjoys life for a season. Right? Only for, only for a season. And I want you to know that you can, you can do your own thing. You can set out to be the captain of your own soul. But I promise you, you will enjoy life for a season. And you will get crushed under the weight of being your own savior. Yes. Amen. And sometimes, okay, sometimes, it's, now you might not like this, sometimes the Father actually allows us to get crushed That's right. so that we could come home. And I know some of you might be praying for individuals to come back home. Maybe the Father's just waiting for them to get crushed. I'm just saying. And so, when you get crushed under the weight of being your own savior, you realize that you can't save yourself and you need to turn another. If only we knew of someone who came to save humanity. If only we knew of someone who called himself the savior, the Messiah, the one who would die on behalf of humanity and would rise again so that we could have everlasting life in him. Oh, wait, that's Jesus. That someone already exists. And so, if you are being crushed under the weight of trying to be your own savior, might I suggest a different one? Not you, but Jesus. Hallelujah. And so he enjoys life for a season, and what happens? Um, a change in circumstances, a severe famine, brings him to go from a son to a slave. So the moment his circumstances change, his identity shifts. I want you to catch that. He goes from being a son and he goes into being a slave and then what does he have? He has this moment of clarity. One translation says he comes to himself. He comes to his senses. What is that? He has a moment of clarity. And what does he say? He says, hey, listen, I think, I think being a servant at home is better than being a servant outside of home. So he goes, I'm just gonna go to my father and say I'm gonna be a servant. I'm gonna be a servant there. And, and, and that is not the mo that's not the moment of repentance, but that is the beginning of repentance. Because if he was to have that moment of clarity but not get up and actually go to his father, he would have never repented. So repentance isn't the moment of clarity. The re repentance is actually turning around and changing your direction. And so this moment of clarity be begins this process of repentance in him. And he, and he gets this longing to go home. And it's interesting that he wants to go home now in his new identity, which is the identity of a slave. Right? Right? I'm doing me has changed. Like, he's gone from being a son into a slave, and he goes, I'm gonna go home even in this broken identity, and I'm gonna fall to the mercy of my father. The mercy of my father. Now, this is a story about two sons. So, remember, we said we gotta look at how this story reveals to us what it means to be lost. What is, what is lostness? And so, I wanna just focus in for a moment on the lostness of the younger brother, the younger. Son. Now, it's obvious because he rejects his father. He leaves. He goes out. He, he spends all the money. 
does all that he can, and so that part is obvious, but here's the other part of his lostness that we might not realize, and that is that sometimes being independent doesn't mean being free. Right? And so, and so don't be fooled by the people you see on social media, by influencers that you see. Man, they're living this independent life. And, and you're like, you know, like little kids now, all they got to do is play video games on YouTube and they become millionaires. Yeah. All right? They move out. You know what I'm talking about? And you go, man, I should, just, I should just quit what I'm doing and start playing video games and recording myself because I could be independent. And we, other, we see other people living the luxurious life and we go, man, what if? If only, if only, if only. And I'd like to tell you that independence doesn't mean free. That you can be independent and still be bound. Yeah. You, you can be independent and you can still be bound. See, see what do you do? What do you do when you, when you freed yourself from being a son and now you're trapped being a slave. You, you freed yourself from being a son, being a daughter, and now you're, now you're trapped being a slave. And that's what sin will do. Sin, what does sin do? It, it enslaves us in the very thing that we thought would set us free. And maybe some of you, you have children who have moved out, who have sought that independent life, and, and they keep coming back to you. It's like, wait, I thought you were living the independent life, man. Why do you keep coming back home? Because they're bound. They're not set free. They're being crushed. They've done something prematurely. They've set out to live a life that they weren't mature enough to handle. And so you keep having to save them. Any parents in the house, who you, you, you go, yeah, I'm tired of saving. I mean, you're probably not tired of saving your kid because they're your kid. But isn't it interesting how the independent spirit eventually dies out? Because that's not what you were created for. And so the brothers, the younger brother's lostness in, is in that. He thinks, man, as long as I can be free from the responsibility, the traditions, and the opinions of, of that which I grew up with, I can be free. And so his sin is obvious. His sin is selfishness. Life is about me who cares about my brother, who cares about my father, who cares about the work that needs to get done at home. Life is about me, and so I'm just gonna do my own thing. That is the sin of the younger brother. That is his lostness. It is the self-absorbed lostness of everything revolving around me, and as long as I'm okay, that's what matters. And then there's the older brother. <laughs> now, this is where things get interesting. See, see, the older brother, uh, the older brother lives at home with his father, okay, watch this, but he's actually never found the father. I wish you heard what I just said. Yeah, yeah, no, he lives at home with his father, but he's never found the father. <laughs> he's found duty. Right, he's, fa he's found duty. He's found, he's found diligence. He's found hard work. He's found a way to build his resume. But he's not found the father. So there is one son who leaves the father's house and says, man, I need to go back to my father. There's another one who never leaves the father's house and yet has never been introduced to the father. And so, and so don't be deceived, church. You can grow up in church your whole life and never be introduced to the Father. I grew up, I grew up in church. I got kicked out of Sunday school. I'm that guy. You know what I mean? And I thought I understood what Christianity was. And I realized I didn't understand what Christianity was. And part of the reason I didn't understand what Christianity was is because people around me also didn't understand what Christianity was. And so they could never paint a clear picture of the gospel and what Jesus has done for me on the cross that I don't have to work for myself. I don't have to do my own efforts and build up my own resume to qualify for a table at the Father's house. He's qualified me. He's died for me. It's by his grace that I've been set free. And so here I am, busy. <laughs> trying to earn my way up. And I thought that was Christianity. And it was, it was about the time I was in grade 10 where I understood the gospel for the first time and I said to myself, man, how come no one has ever told me this before? 
How come no one has ever, ever told me how good God is? It's this moment where his grace became so drawing, I could no longer resist. I was in the Father's house and I finally got introduced to the Father. And I'm praying that some of you would get introduced to the Father. And so don't mistake, I've said this before, but don't mistake proximity to intimacy. Don't, don't mistake nearness to knowing. Don't do it. Because you will deceive yourself. You will think you had something and you will later find out you never had it. And so, so that's, that's the older brother. He, he's an individual who's marked by anger and bitterness. He, he feels superior to the younger brother. He's proud of his own morality. Not only is he proud of his own morality, but he likes to compare his morality to the lack of his younger brother's morality. You ever been there? Right? If we're all honest, when we're having a bad day, it just helps to find somebody having a worse day. <laughs> you know what I mean? If, if we're ever having this moment where we feel guilty before God, it just helps finding someone worse than us. And all of a sudden we go, well, at least I'm not that. <laughs> right? right? Nobody here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's, that's what this individual represents. He represents the sense of feeling better by making other people look worse. He's got a superiority uh, complex. He is marked by self-righteousness. And can I tell you, it's impossible to forgive someone if you always feel like you're better than them. Yeah, good luck forgiving someone you think you're better than. Forgiveness requires humility. Forgiveness requires understanding that you have been given the same, if not more grace than what you're given to this person. And so he represents an individual um, who obeys the father. Isn't that what he said? I've slaved for you, which is an interesting thing to say, isn't it? He doesn't, he doesn't say, look how good of a son I've been. I've slaved for you. Whoa, dude, calm down. <laughs> you know what I mean? No one, no one asked you to slave for the father. You chose to. Because somehow it validated your self-righteousness. Somewhere you believed that the harder you worked, the more you would be approved. And you were, here's the crazy part, okay? He was trying to earn something that the father had already given him. I guarantee that the reason you're feeling exhausted is because you keep trying to earn what the father's already given you. God has pulled back the chair at the table for you to have a seat at. And, and you keep doing laps. that maybe if you're exhausted and tired enough, then you can deserve to sit here. And that doesn't make the father look good. That makes you look good. And if it doesn't make the father look good, but make you look good, it means you've robbed his glory. And maybe what's feeding your self-righteousness is your need to be glorified. How are we doing? Right? Right? Maybe that's why you're self-righteous because you need to be seen. You need to be patted on the back. You need someone to say, good job. Right? Maybe the, maybe the older brother expected that when the younger brother came home that the father would say, hey, why can't you be more like him? Hey, if you want to destroy your children, do that. I'm serious, if you want to tear apart their identity, make sure that they don't actually grow up to be the men and women that God has called them to be. Compare them to your, their siblings and watch them be destroyed. Stop it. Stop it. And so maybe that's what the older brother expected. Hey, why can't you be more like him? 
So what, what does he represent? He, re, he represents joyless and fear-based compliance. See, see, duty is not bad. How many know we have a duty? Yes. To be faithful, Amen. to be obedient. We have a duty. So duty is not bad, but what does the older brother show? He shows that what he did for the father was totally based on duty and not joy and love. You know what we're not told? Okay. Um, what if, okay, we're not told this. This is, just, this is just me speculating, so join me as I speculate. This is what we're not told. Um, what if it was the older brother's dead and joyless obedience that drove the younger brother out? The younger brother out? What if the younger brother never knew the father because the older brother didn't know the father. And what if the younger brother got tired of trying to earn a right at the table because that's what he always saw the older brother do? You know what's interesting is when you begin to ask people, um, not atheists, but people who are unchurched. Do you understand what I mean by unchurched? Um, or not unchurched, dechurched. Um, unchurched would be they got no idea what church is, so they're completely new. Dechurched in the sense that they've grown up in the church, but at some point they left. Uh, you know what a lot of them have in common? Not a problem with God. <laughs> yeah, they got a problem with people. <laughs> they have a problem with you and me. Yeah. Um, because we keep living this joyless, dead thing that we want to call Christianity, but it's actually just dead religion. Yes. Amen. And so if they see no life in you, they will see no hope for themselves. Right. And maybe that's why we can't draw people. Hello? Yeah, because if it's not working for you, why should it work for them? My God. Yeah. If it's, not, if it's not producing life in you. Hello? So we're not, we're not told this, but what if, right? Okay, I got to move on. Are we doing okay? Um, and so that's what, the, that's what the older brother wants to do. He wants to, earn, he wants to earn his way back. But here's what the Bible says. For by grace you have been saved. Through faith. And this is not a doing of yourselves, but it's the gift of God, so that no man may boast. His whole relationship with the Father is about boasting in himself. Look at how I've slaved for you over these years. Not only, not only does he show this sense of losslessness, he also shows this lack of assurance, because that's what happens. When you begin to build a life of religion, you begin to build a life of, I gotta earn my way, I gotta work harder, I gotta put in more effort. Here's what happens, you begin to lack assurance. You have no sense of assurance. He doesn't even know if the Father loves him. He says, I've been with you your whole life, and you never threw me a party. And so there's this lack of assurance. He doesn't even know that the father goes wrong and the father loves him. And maybe you're like this. Maybe, maybe if something goes wrong in your life and a prayer goes unanswered, you think to yourself, maybe I did something wrong. If only I did the right things, then maybe God would have heard and the wrong things would have happened. Right? You ever stub your toe and go, God, like you think, man, what's the last thing I did that was bad because I deserved this? <laughs> right? I'm so serious, we do, we get in a car accident, or well, something happens, something bad happens. The first place our head goes is maybe I deserve this. What did I do wrong that led me in this? And so in the deepest form, there, there's no joy, there's no depth, there's no awe in his relationship with the Father. Um, here's a question I want you to ask. Does your prayer life exist to control your environment, or does it exist to sustain your personal relationship with God. Let me say that again. Does your prayer life exist to control your environment or does it exist to sustain your relationship with God? And if you gave me a, a, just, a, just, just a 
transcript of your prayers, I could tell you which one. Because if all you're ever doing in your time with prayer is asking God for things, you might not have been introduced to the Father. Because your prayer life exists to change your circumstance, not to sustain your relationship with God. Now, here's, are we doing okay? Somebody play the keys, otherwise I'm never gonna end. Okay. <laughs> so, so remember, the, 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 the story ends off on this like, the younger brother gets restored, but what about the older brother? What, what, what is he gonna do? See, because here's the question, here's the question, here's the question. See, the, the younger brother, right? The father finds the younger brother. The question is, will the older brother find the father? That's the point of the story. The younger brother has found the father. Will the older brother find the, the father? And remember, he's talking to Pharisees, he's talking to religious people, and there's even this one moment in Matthew where Jesus says to them, hey, listen, I know you're upset, but I want to let you know that prostitutes, sinners, and tax collectors will enter the kingdom before you do. Why? Because you think you've earned your right. But you've not known the father. But there's hope, church. There's, there's hope for the younger son. There's hope for the older son. There's hope for you and I. If, if, if the younger son, watch this, if the younger son needed to repent for the wrong that he did, the, the older brother needs to repent for the reason, for the reason of the good that he did. See, some of us, we do bad things, and others of us, we do good things for bad reasons. And so the younger brother is too selfish, the older brother is too self-righteous, and here's what I want you to understand. We, we cannot confuse, we cannot confuse loyalty to the father with work for the Father. We cannot be more in love with our ministries, our giftings, and our talents than we are the Father. See, both sons are lost. Both sons have a distance between them and the Father. See, here's how religious people rebel. They rebel by living in such a way that they feel God owes them. They feel God owes them. All these years I slaved over this work for you. You couldn't even give me a go. I earned a go. You owe me. Here's the reality. Both of the sons are living for the things of the father and not the father. Both want his wealth. They don't want him. Both, you ready for the sin of both? Both are pursuing their own will, not the Father's. See, we think, we think sin sometimes is only the obvious things. No, 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 here's, here's what sin is. Here's how subtle sin is. It's choosing your will over the Father's. And both are guilty of that sin. And here's the beauty, okay? Okay. Um, The beauty is this, the father goes out to meet both. The father goes out to meet the younger son and welcome him back in and he goes out of the house which would have been a shameful thing for him to do because the whole village would have been a part, a, a part of this celebration and so where's the older son? So the father goes to find him and he entreats him, he pleads with him, hey come in and celebrate. So in, bo in both the cases, the father goes out to meet the son. The father demonstrates his grace and his goodness to both the older and the younger. And I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if the younger son, I wonder if the younger son would have said to himself, man, where's my older brother? How, how come my neighbors are here celebrating, but my own flesh and blood isn't? I wonder if he thought to himself, where's my, where's my older brother? See, church, I want to tell you, you have an older brother. 
There's a third son not mentioned in this story. And he's the son of total and complete obedience to the father. Out of love. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that who should ever, whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The third son is telling the story. And I wanna tell you that you and I don't have a, an older brother who is anger, who is angry over us and, and bittered over us. No, 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 we have an older brother who set his own life down for us. So I'm done. How do you change your heart, okay? How do you change your heart? Whether you're the younger brother or you're, you're the older brother, how do you change your heart? Um, you take a good, long look at what it cost to bring you home. You look at what it cost to bring you home. For the Bible says that when Jesus was hanging on the cross between two criminals, dying the death that you and I deserved. Giving mercy to a thief on the cross next to him. The Bible says that Jesus breathed his last breath. And before doing so, he said to the Father, 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 why have you forsaken me? Jesus was removed from his home with the Father so that you could be welcomed home. When Jesus is forsaken on the cross, I want you to understand that that is the only time that there has ever been distant and separation between the father and his son. So that other sons and other daughters could come home. That's the cost. That's the cost. Would you pray with me? Just bow your heads. Thank you, Father. God, I know you're here. I know you're here. I know you're here. Father, just now minister to your people, just as every head is bowed and eyes closed. Minister to your people from the heart of the Father. The heart of the Father. For God would say, I see you and I know you and I have never left you out of my sight. In moments where you have turned away and you have set out to do your own thing, I have always kept you in mind and in heart. And in moments where you thought you could earn your way, I would show you my love and show you my mercy that I have sent my son to die on the cross for you so that there would be no distance between the Father and you. Would you hear the Father's voice, son and daughter? He wants to welcome you home. as every head is bowed and eyes closed if, if you are sensing that it is your time to come home to receive the free gift of forgiveness that is only found in Jesus if you feel that's you I'm going to invite you to pray a simple prayer that is this father I receive my welcome. It's a gift. All you have to do is receive it. Father, I receive my welcome that you have paid for by sending your son. I receive my welcome. I receive my welcome. God, I feel you. If you prayed that prayer, would you just raise your hand? I wanna pray specifically for you. Just as every head is bowed and eyes closed, this is a moment between you and God. If you prayed that prayer, 
I see your hand, I see your hand. Thank you, God. Don't be shy. This is a moment between you and God. Just raise it up. I want to pray specifically for you. I see that hand. I see that hand. Father, I thank you for these hands, and more importantly, I thank you for the hearts, the hearts that will now know you as their Father, hearts that will now know you as their God, know you as their Savior, hearts that have received their welcome home. And so, Father, fill them with new life, with everlasting life, with everlasting joy. Let them from here on be completely devoted to you because of the love that you have shed for them on the cross. May there be no question, no doubt that they belong to you, that they are your sons and your daughters in the name of Jesus. And Father, I pray for the rest of us. Let love overwhelm us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, can we just thank God? Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for watching. We really appreciate your time. Will you please like and subscribe so that you will get notifications? And by the way, your comments and your feedback are very important to us. Even sermon series and messages that you would like to hear about, please let us know. Drop us a line. We would love to incorporate that into our teaching and our preaching. We appreciate you and thank you.